Hello everyone, thank you for joining us. Tim Cunningham, our product specialist for our production board test business unit will be presenting today and we'll be taking questions later on so feel free to enter them in the chat throughout the session and I'll pass it over to Tim to get started. Thank you, Christina. My name is Tim Cunningham. I am a product specialist at Teradyne. Uh, I've been in the test industry for about 37 years now, so I've seen a lot of things uh, come and go. Today, we're going to talk about your data has been talking. Have you been listening? So it ought to be an interesting discussion on uh, some things that may be obvious and some things that may not be. But a little bit, let's talk about uh, the test quality background. Some of the comments you might hear in test is we don't have any problems until boards arrive at tests. I'm sure you've all heard that. Or test is a gray area. Boards seem to get hung up at in-circuit test. And there's a reason for that. Usually, maybe not the in-circuit portion, but it may be the process. We have many failures at in-circuit tests, but once we get past ICT, there are no issues at functional system test, but those tests take forever. Well, if they take forever and they pass, ICT's done its job. Or we need at least 20 production boards to qualify our test set. We never get a golden board. We always have to make a golden board with our ICT. And that says a little something about in-circuit test and making golden boards. Or the test works on machine A, but it doesn't work well on machine B. We hear you. And the good news is the tools do exist to avoid these issues. And we'll talk about those today and how to resolve many of these common things that you run into every day. Through measuring, analyzing, adjusting, and monitoring the process to control it so that the process doesn't control you. So feedback tools are necessary to build confidence into the process. And this is what we're gonna get into. Measuring quality and maximizing profitability. Uh, we all, all wanna start earlier in the process. We wanna ramp faster. And we want to maintain that product momentum longer. And there's reasons for that because it does affect profitability. If we can ramp sooner and our test sets are ready to go before we have X number of boards to qualify our tests, there are other ways we can qualify that test to maximize the quality of the test set so that you can accelerate and, and ramp faster and maintain that momentum in controlling your process. So some areas in reducing the cost of operation, uh, obviously eliminating, the, eliminating those frequent debugging uh, things that pop up or improving inconsistent test measurement repeatability, eliminating different test programs for each line. The same program should work the same on every line. And those are things we're going to address as well. We always want to avoid the false calls and the escapes in our process, but more importantly, we want a way to eliminate that constant hammering away, debugging every day when issues pop up. And this circles more around the quality of your test set. We can improve that quality. We can eliminate this so that we're not out on the production floor addressing issues that we knew about early in the process, but we chose not to do anything about. So our goal was to avoid that frequent debugging and maintenance due to poor testability. In ways we can do that, we need to quantify our test program stability. The Greek letter sigma is a statistical symbol that tells us what the standard deviation is. And in a six sigma process, it's expected to be defect free. So if we can get our measurements into a six sigma area and make sure that we've got a good test before we start, we can eliminate a lot of these problems we talked about uh, on the first slide. Those marginal measurements increase false call rates. And so those are things that we want to attack early in the process so that we don't have to do frequent debugging once the uh, manufacturing process begins. And then we want to eliminate unnecessary rework and repair. And also those, those uh, defects that could escape the process because we don't have a quality test. And a lot of this takes a good uh, test system with measurement repeatability in the first place in order to meet some of these metrics so that you don't have to widen the windows uh, so a Mack truck could, could drive through it and possibly pass product that's uh, substandard. So we're looking at the range of measurements, we're looking at the variance, and we're gonna come up with some statistical information. Two metrics that you might see in the process are CP and CPK. So we're gonna talk about the relationship 
These are statistical measurements. The CP is our process capability ratio. And that CP number, we look for that to be at least one or higher. When CP is one or higher, that means the process is capable. The higher, the better. But below one, we determine that the process is not capable. So if your CP metric is below one, it's not capable. Within our measurement windows that we see in a debug process, which we'll see more of later, we'll see that it gives us those metrics for the mean standard deviation, the CPK, and the CP. These all have meaningful relationships in our process. So CP is going to be a measurement that's centered about the mean of the values that we measure. And so we don't care about the upper and lower limit, that's just a range. So that's what this equation tells us. And we're gonna divide that range of 110 minus 90, which is 20, by six standard deviations. And we see the standard deviation in the tool. So it's very easy for us to calculate this and display it for you. So you don't have to go through all the math. The tools are there and those are things that we wanna focus on. CPK is the process capability index, accounting for the proximity or the shift in the mean. So when the actual values that we measure as we see in this window have a different range, hopefully less than our upper and lower window, so that it passes, but the more we can get a better measurement and reduce that variance in our test measurement process, the higher we're gonna drive the CPK value. So if it's shifted to the left or to the right, that's gonna impact uh, the CPK value. The CPK can approach the CP because CP is a normalized value about what we're actually measuring. And we're creating our standard deviations based on six standard deviations in our metric tool. But CPK cannot exceed CP. CP will be our target for CPK. And the relationship is if CPK is too far away from CP, that means our, our measurement, our mean is shifted to the left or to the right, depending on the value that, that is calculated. So the tools are there to give you these numbers. And we like to focus on the CPK metric to qualify the quality of our test. And as you see, when we, we put the actual value in here, the mean has shifted and slightly different than how we calculated the CP. So that's what affects the CPK metric. The farther that mean shifts from the center of our limits, the more impact it's gonna have on the CPK and the further it's gonna go away from the CP value, our process capability ratio. As we can see in this view with our histogram chart, if that standard deviation is reduced because our variance is much smaller and our test is much more efficient and effective, in measuring and repeat, repeating this measurement, we see that that CPK value is rather high. 58 is, is really good uh, for this part. So we'll talk about that relationship next. Applying CPK to the process yield, uh, when we talk about the signal levels, six standard deviations equates to a CPK of 2.0. And that's really what we wanna target is the 2.0. Now, if we take a look at this chart over here, we see these standard deviations along the bottom, but the CPK is 1.33. And the reason it is 1.33 is 1.33 is four standard deviations. And we, we look at this and say, okay, how many six standard deviations can we fit within these standard deviations that we have, plus or minus four? So if we, we count from minus four to plus two, that's six standard deviations. So that's one, but we have two left over. So those two represent one third of six standard deviations. So our value for CPK is 1.33. And the more we can tighten our measurement up within this window, the higher we can drive the CPK because our standard deviation is going to go down. So relating CPK to the repeatability and a process yield, when we get to a CPK of two, which is the six sigma level, we have a process fallout of 0.002 in terms of defects per million opportunities per PPM. So that's really the goal we're trying to get is, is tighten up our, our um, measurement capability to make sure it fits within the window so that we have a quality test. Now we talked about some of the theory. Let's apply the statistics uh, in the real world. We create these uh, metrics for you so you're not guessing. They're presented to you on the screen in a series of tools available to you at each stage of the process, whether it's debug or development, 
we're at the end when we're in manufacturing. There are built-in statistical reporting tools in Testation Debug Pro that allow us to focus on the quality so that we can make the changes necessary to meet those metrics. There are process tools to report stability issues prior to program release. And again, these are all calculated for you, so there's no guessing. The numbers are prevented, uh, presented to you so that you have the ability to make the adjustment to control the process before it controls you. And we provide the monitoring reporting tools available in Production Pro. These are the things we're gonna talk about and how we apply those in the real world. In Test Station Debug Pro, we have these uh, charts, either a run chart or a histogram that will display the results as we're debugging. So early in the process, we know the focus is on quality and that CPK value of 114 here tells us we got a pretty good test. In the other histogram chart, the CPK is 0.8562, something like that. I know you can't see this on your screen, but that is below one. And as we said earlier, our process capability ratio, when it's below one, the process is not capable. So this is a test that needs some definite work. But all of these quality criteria calculations are presented on this screen. I like to focus on CPK because the higher I can get my CPK, the better quality test that I have. And it will highlight issues early in the process. If you're in debug and you see something below one for CP, you know there's probably an issue there or it might be the way the test is uh, implemented. But it's something that needs attention at that point. And that could be the wrong test parameters on your source of measure channels. It could be delay issues or incorrect guard selection. But we certainly wanna make sure we maintain that CPK compliance. And if you're looking for Six Sigma, that's gonna be two or greater. However, when you're debugging a board, you have a single sample. And so that's going to kind of change the way we look at the CPK metric. That metric probably should be about 10 to 15 X of the target. So if you're looking for a CPK of two, it probably should be looking for 20 or 30 in debug. And the reason I say that is because you got a single sample, you have no variance for that part. But when you get into the production process, you will have a variation of measurements that will increase the spread and increase the variance. And that will drop the CPK down. So the numbers you see in debug are gonna be inflated, much um, higher than what you can expect in the manufacturing process when the vari variance is added to the equation. So I, as a good rule of thumb, you certainly want your CPK to be uh, a number higher. For some tests, it probably needs a little bit higher. For some tests, it doesn't matter. Uh, for diodes, when we're looking for a four voltage drop test, it doesn't matter. It's not gonna vary that much anyway. So uh, we're not looking for the 10X in that case. But for other parts, it, it's a good rule of thumb to use. We want the highest CPK we can get is, is the bottom line. And a single sample measures that repeatability. So what we see in the debug tools is the capability or the ability to repeat that measurement on a repeatable basis and within the, uh, the value that we're measuring. So at this point, we're just looking to test quality. We're not adding variance to the equation. That's why it's important to get that CPK as high as you can. And what we know from his, history is a single sample statistically correlates to multiple samples. So for one board, as again, it's, there's gonna be a factor where when you're in production, it's gonna be much lower than what you see in debug. And that's because you're adding variance to the equation. The Debug Pro uh, provides a connections editor, which allows us to measure and analyze uh, the process. Here we have a, a part that's failing 25 times out of, and passing five out of 30 runs. The test isn't meeting the metric. It's not even inside the window. And that's why our CP is zero. This is a very incapable process. The connection editor allows us to look at the guards on the source and the measure side of the channel. And quickly we can visually see all the guards are on the source channel, they're not on the measure. This is a bad test. We don't guard on the source channel because that's not how passive guarding works. Our guards are applied on the measure channel. That's why we try to set the equation up where we're sourcing on the side with the most number of connections to it and measuring on the side with the least number of connections because that's fewer points to guard because guarding is performed on the measurement channel side in a passive guarding system. 
And when we apply that guard here and get rid of the other guards on the source channel, we can monitor what we just did. We made an adjustment. We've monitored. Now we've got it under control. We're within the window. Our CPK is at 114. And our CP is at 148. That just tells us we're not completely centered. And we can see that with this chart. So those numbers tell us what's going on. But we can also visually see what's happening as we're debugging our, uh, our boards before we release them to production. Then there's the Debug Pro, uh, the link to D2B. We focus on these measurement results within the window in our Debug Pro session, and we get that instant feedback on quality so that we can identify issues early. If that CPK metric is low, in this case, it's uh, below one, this test needs a lot of work. So there's some issues that we got to look at. Now, if we can't see everything with the connections editor for guarding, maybe we need to take a closer look at the circuitry. If we click on the D2B display, which is designed to build uh, in the Debug Pro environment, it will activate our D2B display, which we can, we can pull up at any time in the background. If you have two monitors on your system, you can have your Debug Pro on one, on one screen and the Design to Build tool on the other screen so that you don't have to flip back and forth. But if you're on a single screen, that information is there. So if we stop on R14, in a debug process, D2B is already focused on that component on the board, zoomed in, and on that component on the schematic. You can zoom in and zoom out and pan around these, these uh, displays. So it keeps the focus on the current device. There's no searching required in this process. It's already there. And so if you had to go out and get a piece of paper, schematics 80 pages long, 100 pages long, we know how that works, or you have a PDF in another window, you have to switch back and forth. But with a design to build link linked in the debug pro environment, you can work more productively because it's always there at your fingertips. You're not searching for it. You're just switching between the, the, the windows within the system to see that display in the background. You're not searching for it because it's already focused on the part because that's the part that's linked to the debug tool. As you make those changes, you can quickly see those results change and fade away and increase your CPK as you adjust those parameters and monitor it so that you can get it under control. Now under TS Debug Pro, there's the Analyze tool. Once you've done your debug and you're ready to go into, before you go into production, there's a tool that we use to qualify your test set. Is it ready for production? It measures the quality of your test program. It reports the analog quality, and the digital fault coverage, as we see on this uh, screen here to the right. It identifies any tests that need to be improved. If we click on the view report, we can see all the tests that don't meet the quality criteria metrics. So th these results are based on your user quality criteria settings. You set the metrics for your test to meet so that you know you have the confidence when you go into production, you won't be out on the floor every day tweaking the program to make it work. And so the me measurement metrics that we get in this report are very concise for the performance results. It's gonna show you the high, low, min, mean, max, standard deviation, the CP and the CPK, there it is. It's all calculated for you, as well as the proximity. So we're taking the, uh, the hard work out of the calculations by presenting those to you up front. And then if we don't meet any of these metrics set in the quality criteria, it's gonna tell us, do we have wide limits that are wider than our bill of material stated? Is it an unstable test because of the CPK metric? Is it close to the edge because the proximity is already 20% high on the high end or 20% on the low end? If it's missing a limit or there's no limits, and if it's failing or passing, or if the test passes when the board is lifted from the test fixture or from the press. And so we need to identify these types of problems early in the process. That's why we have the Analyze tool in place. It's just an effective tool for quantifying the test program production readiness to qualify your test set. It is also a great tool uh, for gauging the quality of your test. So if you're receiving your test program from a third party or an internal supplier within your company, it's, it's a way that we can measure the quality to set the buy-off metrics. If it doesn't meet that quality, the bottom line is, if it doesn't pass those metrics, you're going to be spending time on the manufacturing floor fixing these problems day to day, hammering away, just like that guy earlier in the slides with a jackhammer. We don't want to be that guy. 
we, we don't want to be the jackhammer guy. We want to make sure that we're in the relaxed mode because we've taken care of these problems before we got into the production process. So the goal is to realize the quality and also the profitability sooner, because if we're releasing those test sets without these problems that we can circumvent in the first place, then that's going to reduce the amount of time we have to maintain uh, that process or the test program. The analyze report has the, the, uh, the quality criteria settings as defined earlier. We can set the, uh, the proximity range and the stability of the test, the CP, the process capability ratio. And with those standards, we can go in and identify tests that aren't performing up to our criteria. And again, remember, these metrics probably should be 10 to 20 times higher than what you expect in production because this is a single board, a single sample that they're derived from. But there is a direct correlation on a different scale as we get into the production process. We see it time and time again. Uh, I like to go into a customer site and say, let me see your analyze report or create one, and I'll tell you what the problems are. And then when we look at the log reports after you know, 1,000, 2,000, or 100,000 boards have run, we see really, really uh, early in the process, we could identify these problems before they became a problem, and we can fix them. In this case, we get R341. It's on the edge because the proximity is minus 60.8. Our quality criteria said if it's over 60% deviated from the center, then we're gonna flag it, and that's what we did. And we can see that reflected in the CPK. CPK is 52, you say, well, that's pretty high. Well, the CP is 133. So we've deviated from that quite a bit. That tells me that our measurement's not centered, and that's also reflected in the proximity. So all these numbers play hand in hand. We have the ability to go out and analyze all these results for the analog, digital. We can gauge the stability, repeatability, identify tests that pass when the boards lifted up from the receiver, and also identify tests with excessive back drive currents. So we're getting a good comprehensive report before we go into production. So we're building confidence into the process by working smarter, not harder. Another tool I like to use, I've got a Perl script I use to take that analyze report and pull the metrics out and put them into a comma delimited format. So I can pull it into the Excel spreadsheet for easier sorting. And if you'd like this tool, just contact CS1 at teradyne.com and uh, we can get you suited up with that. It's just a little Perl script that runs and allows us to get a format to look at it in a spreadsheet. While in a spreadsheet, I can set rules for proximity and CPK that flag these as we see in yellow over here. But if we look at one of the first tests up here, for this capacitor, we have a, uh, a mean of 264 picofarad, uh, a min of 263.999, and a max of 264, which is pretty good. That's reflected in our CP, 370. That is, is a good test. However, the CPK number is deviated from that CP. And that tells me I've got a shift, and we can see that in the proximity value. We're shifted uh, 45 uh, measurement units from the center of the mean. It's still passing, but we probably it may need to take a look at that and see if we can uh, get that CPK up a little higher. It's a good test. It's not really a concern, but it does highlight there's something going on in, in the relationship between CP, CPK, and proximity is my point. And so if we uh, take a look at this closer, we've seen the CP, CPK, and the proximity becomes clear because it highlights why the CPK isn't close to the CP because of that shift. There's the analyze graph, which kind of graphically tells you what's going on. So we can go measure, analyze, make the adjustments and monitor after we've made those adjustments. And if we've uh, improved our passing and marginal test, we can go back and make the changes that the report reflects and Control the process. We're going to shrink this down. You may not always be able to get 100% in passing and as far as marginal pass goes because there are some tests that may only have one limit, a high or low limit that pop up in this report. And that, that's certainly okay. But the focus is getting rid of the problems that mean something so that when we do get to production, we don't have to go out and tweak the program. In a production pro environment, we have... Uh, a couple tools available when you're in production uh, to monitor the process, and that's the stats report. The stats report can be enabled, and that will show you the top failing components in this particular test run. 
So you can get a grip on, okay, what's failing? And we can see right away what the top failures are within this graph. There's a yield meter that shows the uh, yield rate. Uh, and you can also set parameters within the production uh, pro environment to stop the test from running when the yield drops below a user-defined threshold. So if your threshold is 90% or 80%, you set that, and when we drop below that yield rate, we, we uh, flag something is going on and we need to stop the process. Maybe it's a process problem, maybe it's a test problem, but the tool is there to identify something is happening and it needs attention. Also a throughput meter to let you know how many boards or panels are being produced per hour just by walking by the machine and glancing. At a whole other level, we have the web access or the web link uh, HTML tool that's there for real-time information. And this provides an HTML output. Every time a test is run or a board is run, this HTML file is updated. It's a web page display, creates an HTML file as I mentioned. It provides statistical information about your board yield, your system idle time, utilization, and throughput. Uh, you can see the passing and failing boards here as well. So what's nice about this tool, you don't have to go out to the production floor to see what's happening with each individual test system. You can create a separate web page for each system or each test station in your facility that generates this and put it on the server somewhere. And then you can easily view this data either from your desktop, a laptop, a smartphone, or a tablet to see what's happening at any given time from that particular system. So this is something you can integrate within your own uh, web environment so that you have links to it. You can also modify, it's just a template, so it's easy to make some changes and, and change the way it's displayed. The test quality tools adjust limit is another tool that's available to you to center up your metrics about the mean. We've talked about the CPK to resolve those shifts. So you can specify how much you wanna shift the uh, measurement or widen the limits to increase that CPK. Uh, these are user-defined options you set up in the software, and it also checks against the user-defined quality criteria that we've seen before to make sure we're meeting the metrics. And if we're not meeting those metrics, we need to go back and make the adjustments. But this tool allows us to center it. As we can see in this data display tool, we have most of our measurements are already centered up in the center, and our deviations are from that center aren't very much. So it's a pretty good uh, analysis of what the Adjust Limits tool can do for us to center our measurements about the mean. Now a little bit more about the data display statistic reports. This is a tool that we have available that will take our log data and allow us to look at component overviews, the top failing components, measured values, board test volumes, board volumes and board yields, a lot of things. And we can sort this data on passing, failing, and whatever metric we, we uh, desire. In this case, we're, we see the uh, component overview with a mean in the center, the high and the low limits, we can see the mean of the actual values are shifted one way or the other and the spread across that mean. These are sorted by CPK, the maximum CPK followed by the least as we go down this chart. So we can see these measurements uh, have a high CPK, but we can certainly improve those tests uh, based on the data that we have here. And if we need to look at something specifically, we can double click on it and another window pops up to drill in on the information for this test. And what we can see on this test is that uh, the value for the mean is shifted from the center. We can also look at trending analysis and failure analysis with this tool. So when we're in that mode, we identify the mean, we know this value is shifted. And one of the things that we wanna do is get, get this shift so that we get it into compliance. So maybe, this is a functional test, it's not an in-circuit test, but in this case, uh, maybe our, our mean value needs to be here and we need to adjust our variance across there to, uh, to qualify that test. Otherwise, we're already close to the edge and maybe some of these metrics, if we put the bell curve on here, says, oh, we're gonna fall off the edge here if we continue with this test. So it's, it's really a culture change and the goal is to improve the repeatability and when we do that, we will improve our profitability because we're spending less time resolving those issues. The data display tool also has the top failing components that we can go in and take a look at, at uh, our production runs and see, do we have fixture related problems? In this case we do. And then we have a capacitor that has an issue here. So we wanna identify those problems and resolve the issues, whether it's a process problem, whether it's a temperature related problem, maybe elevated capacitor values, because when capacitors are heated up, 
and you're testing the board as, as it comes through the process and it's very warm, that ages the cap very quickly. And so it increases the value. Depending on the dielectric that's used, you may see these values shift just a little bit or you may see them shift a lot depending on whether it's an X5R, X7R or a TCO type of uh, dielectric that's used on these parts. But clearly this test has uh, some something that needs to be done and maybe it's a test that's not performing well or maybe it's that temperature profile when the boards are heated up. That definitely needs addressed in the process. We can also highlight component defects, problems with the program, test fixture problems. You'll see that reflected in the top failing components. The good news is if you go out and address these each day, whether it's the top three or the top five or the top 10 failures, you can quickly get rid of these problems. These are problems and they need addressed. It could be a process problem or it could be a test program problem. If it's a test set problem, those are things we need to focus on. As we make those changes, we can watch the problems fade away. We'll see these top 10 failing components disappear and we may see new ones, but we've got the process under control now. It doesn't take very long to get it under control. And we can certainly see the mean has shifted here uh, about this test. So that affects the CPK uh, dramatically. Uh, another function in the data display tool is the export data. We can export data in a tab delimited output format, suitable for importing into Excel. It allows us to sort the data so we can see our top performing CPKs as well as on the bottom end, our bottom uh, and it shows CPKs that are less than two in the manufacturing process. Remember, if, if CP is less than one, it's not process capable. So there are some tests that need some attention. Now, some of these CPK metrics are zero because there's not a high and a low limit and it requires that to calculate the value. So those types of tests are okay because we're looking either at a high or a low limit and, and the, the metrics really don't come into play here because we don't have an upper boundary and a bottom boundary. So keep those in mind uh, when you look at those reports. And at the end of all this, we have a new tool that's been out here for the past year or so, is the factory-wide real-time production monitoring. That's the smart Four metrics The smart Four metrics uh, is gonna show the key performance indicators for the test station. And we calculate the overall equipment effectiveness, which is a calculation of three factors, the availability, the performance, and the quality. And we might be looking at the system temperature, whether the machine's available, uh, what the utilization is, those metrics are out there to give you some more additional information, insight to how the process is running. So there's a lot of tools that are provided out here to give you information in the process. So kind of winding down here, the feedback tools are in place. And, and earlier on, we talked about some of those things. We need 20 boards in the process to begin uh, to qualify our test set. Well, maybe you do, it, it certainly helps. But with a single board, you have the statistical information that allows you to address the problems before they really become a problem. So the metrics are in place. You just have to embellish that data and that information and adopt that culture change because you know, running 20 boards and getting a pass doesn't qualify a test set unless you qualify the metrics uh, within that. And so we're, we have the run chart, the analyze report, the data logging tool, data display, the adjust limits tool, the HTML web client, and then now we have smart for metrics that allows us to monitor the performance, make those adjustments and control that process so that we can build confidence, maximize our profit and ship quality products. So the tools are there. We just need to listen to the data. The data tells us something from the very beginning all the way through the production process. If we don't fix it in the debug process, when the CPK metric is low, we're gonna see that reflected in the manufacturing process. And the tool is going to continually remind us that there's a problem. We need to go fix it. So go out there and fix it. And then you can relax. My name is Tim Cunningham. Thank you for listening. And I'll turn it back over to Christina for any questions. All right. So as Tim said, we'll take some questions now. If you have a question for us, go ahead and leave it in the chat. Um, in the meantime, I do have um, a question. It says, I'm a test developer and typically I only have a single board. I didn't think it was possible to get a stable program with only one board. Are you saying that it is? Uh, well, you know, certainly uh, that, that's a good question and probably a lot of people ask that question. Does a single board allow you 
to address probably greater than 95% of the common issues you're gonna see. It's really that CPK metric. It, there's a direct correlation from the debug process to manufacturing. And we see it time and time again. And a small sample bores may allow you to address the more, majority of the issues before they appear in production. And our goal is to let you see the metrics to tell you how the test performs from a statistical point of view to avoid those common issues. And I've, I've seen people be successful with a single board. And when they get into production, there might be a handful of components that uh, what we call our problem children. We have to go out and adjust the uh, attitudes of those measurements to get the results. But you can certainly get up on that curve a lot quicker, which is really the goal here is to, to ramp quicker, get our tests uh, set so that they, they provide repeatable results early in the process rather than waiting for the production to begin to go back and have production remind us of all those things that we ignored early in the process that we could have addressed. All right. Um, and then the next one is, I'd like to learn how to use some of these tools more in depth. Are there any trainings available on these tools specifically? Um, there are some, uh, some tools. We have um, a test station basic uh, course, which will go live later this fall. The advanced class is planned for release uh, later this year, and we'll have lessons covering the use of these tools, the general best practices for improving test quality. And the best way to get this information is to sign up for our newsletter, uh, and you can keep updated with the release class, classes that will be released at www.teradyne.com forward slash ICT dash training. Again, that's www.teradyne.com forward slash ICT dash training. And uh, that'll keep you up to date with what's happening and when these classes will release. Awesome. And I just want to pop into and say we do have online um, classes that are releasing. That's what Tim's referring to. But we do also have in-person training if that's what you're looking for. Um, I don't see any additional questions coming through. So if any pop up, um, you can certainly post them here on LinkedIn and we'll answer them. Or you can contact him directly at his email on the screen, which is tim.cunningham at teradyne.com. Um, thank you again for joining us today. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you very much. Have a great day.